Hello, I am Mark Chaplow from the University of Iowa and the Veterans Affairs Medical Center in Iowa City, Iowa. As an editor for Experimental Physiology, I am very pleased to highlight a series of symposium reports just published in our journal. The symposium titled, The Heart is Lost Without the Brain, The Autonomic Perspective, organized by Dr. Sue Piner and Andy Trafford, took place at the Physiological Society meeting in London in July 2014. The titles of the symposium presentations and corresponding speaker names are shown here. Let's begin with the presentation by Julian Payton from the University of Bristol titled, Application of a Silicon Brain for Physiological Cardiac Pacing and Heart Failure. Dr. Payton described the development of silicon central pattern generators, or CPGs, used to modulate biological responses to physiological signals. The specific application illustrated utilized an external CPG based on reciprocally coupled neurons to generate and modulate the respiratory sinus arrhythmia that reflects parasympathetic mediated changes in heart rate. The experimental preparation, the in situ working heart brainstem preparation, is illustrated in the figure. The CPG delivers electrical stimulation to the vagus nerve to decrease heart rate. The heart rate modulation is synchronized to the respiratory cycle by input signals originating from the directly recorded phrenic nerve activity. Loss of respiratory sinus arrhythmia predicts poor outcomes post myocardial infarction and in patients with heart failure. Thus, the CPG provides a novel therapeutic approach to restore respiratory sinus arrhythmia and heart failure with potential for improving cardiac function and extending life. The potential of the silicon CPG and its use to modulate respiratory sinus arrhythmia are described in a recent review article published in the Journal of Physiology, noted here in the figure. Thus, a symposium report on this topic is not included in this issue of experimental physiology. Kieran Brack from the University of Liechtenstein gave the second presentation in the symposium titled, The Heart's Little Brain in Controlling Cardiac Function in the Rabbit. In his report, Dr. Brack reviews the anatomical and functional characteristics of intrinsic cardiac neurons, including their interactions with the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems and their influence on cardiac function. Results obtained using an isolated, innervated Langendorf heart preparation for functional studies and a microdissected whole atrial preparations for immun immunohistochemistry are highlighted. The location of cardiac ganglia and numbers of intrinsic cardiac neurons at various sites are described for the rabbit. While the majority of intrinsic cardiac neurons express the cholinergic marker choline acetyltransferase as expected, a substantial number of neurons express the noradrenergic marker tyrosine hydroxylase. Interestingly, some neurons are immunoreactive for both enzymes, suggesting dual functions. Furthermore, neurons containing the neuronal isoform of nitric oxide synthase are found in some of the intrinsic cardiac ganglia. The results reaffirm that cardiac ganglia are complex structures containing multiple types of neurons. Localized stimulation of cardiac ganglia was shown to decrease or increase heart rate and atrioventricular interval, with responses dependent in part on which ganglia was stimulated. The role of specific cardiac ganglia in mediating antiarrhythmic effects of cervical vagus nerve stimulation is also addressed. Areas in need of additional research are identified, including the need for better understanding of the functional connectivity between ganglionic plexuses and how intrinsic cardiac neurons are affected in pathological states such as arrhythmia, myocardial ischemia, and heart failure. The symposium report by Neil Herring from the University of Oxford stays with the theme of neural regulation of cardiac function. In his report titled, Autonomic Control of the Heart, Going Beyond the Classical Neurotransmitters, Dr. Herring reviews the evidence for release of the cotransmitter neuropeptide Y, or NPY, along with norepinephrine from sympathetic nerve terminals. 
An isolated atrial preparation with intact right stellate ganglia and right vagus nerve was used to demonstrate sympathetic induced release of NPY and NPY's inhibitory effects on vagally induced release of acetylcholine and bradycardia. An innervated Langendorf perfused heart preparation was used to demonstrate effects of sympathetic nerve stimulation and NPY on ventricular fibrillation threshold and optical mapping experiments used a voltage sensitive dye revealed pro-arrhythmic actions of NPY on ventricular myocytes. To investigate NPY and its receptors as possible therapeutic targets, experiments were performed after administering a beta adrenergic receptor blocker, a drug commonly prescribed for heart failure. The contributions of NPY to autonomic control of heart rate are summarized in the figure. Blockade of NPY Y2 receptors expressed on cholinergic neurons in cardiac ganglia attenuates vaguely induced bradycardia post sympathetic stimulation, whereas blockade of Y1 receptors abrogates proarrhythmic actions of NPY on ventricular myocytes. Thus, targeting, i.e., blocking, the Y2 receptor may facilitate vagal bradycardia and decrease resting heart rate, while targeting the Y1 receptor may prevent ventricular arrhythmias independent of heart rate. The symposium report, authored by Carolyn Barrett from the University of Auckland, shifts the focus from cardiac to renal nerves. The title of her report is Renal Sympathetic Nerves, What Have They Got to Do with Cardiovascular Disease? The development of a clinically applicable method of denervating the kidneys in patients with hypertension and other diseases associated with increased sympathetic nerve activity has renewed interest in the role of renal nerves in development of these diseases. In her symposium report, Dr. Barrett reviews the physiological effects of renal sympathetic nerve activity on cardiovascular and renal functions, noting both adaptive beneficial responses and potentially deleterious effects in hypertension and heart failure. Important variables to consider in evaluating the efficacy of renal nerve ablation in treating hypertension and heart failure are discussed. Interestingly, renal nerve denervation appears to provide widespread protection in multiple pathological states, including myocardial ischemia and heart failure. The protection has been ascribed to inhibition of sympathetic activity to other target organs. The potential for increased renal sympathetic nerve activity to increase sympathetic activity to other organs, such as the heart, is shown schematically in this figure taken from Dr. Barrett's symposium report. Feed-forward mechanisms driving the increases in sympathetic activity may include activation of renal afferent nerves and or central actions of angiotensin II. Dr. Barrett's symposium report provides an important cautionary note. While the evidence is strong that decreasing renal sympathetic nerve activity should be beneficial in hypertension and heart failure, many questions remain to be answered as to the exact role the renal nerves are playing, and how and when to target the sympathetic nervous system in patients with variable underlying pathophysiology. The final symposium report, authored by Susan Duchars from the University of Leeds, is titled, How Sympathetic Are Your Spinal Cord Circuits? While the critical role of sympathetic preganglionic neurons, or SPNs, in mediating sympathetic outflow is widely recognized, Many are unfamiliar with the striking heterogeneity and complexity of these neurons. SPNs exhibit heterogeneity with respect to their location, neurochemistry, connectivity, and function. In her report, Dr. Duchars focuses on the presence of interneurons and gap junctions within these neuronal circuits and their importance in determining the level and pattern of sympathetic discharge. GABAergic presympathetic interneurons inhibit SPNs and contribute to rhythmic patterns of sympathetic discharge. This figure illustrates electrically coupled SPNs in panel A and panel B, decreased network oscillatory activity recorded in the intermedial lateral cell column after addition of the gap junction blocker mefloquine, panel C, 
and blunting of a chemoreflex-induced increase in sympathetic nerve discharge by mefloquin, panel D. In her report, Dr. Dushars also describes the severe autonomic dysregulation that occurs after spinal cord injury with emphasis on the neuroplastic changes that occur in spinal cord interneurons and gap junctions associated with SPNs, as well as the potential for neural stem cells to restore SPN activity and autonomic function. To sum up, the symposium reports published in this issue of Experimental Physiology highlight recent discoveries and novel mechanisms by which the autonomic nervous system regulates cardiovascular function in health and disease. I was particularly impressed by the unique experimental approaches and preparations used by the authors. Gaps in our knowledge are identified. The drive to translate basic science discoveries to clinical therapies is evident. I hope you enjoy reading the reports.